Good evening, fellow Earthlings. Thank you. Thank you. I'm Mission Control tonight. Uh, Crosby Kemper, the director of the library. And uh, uh, I do want to mention one bit of business. I, as we do uh, I, uh, all the time when we're down here in Kirk Hall, <clears throat> excuse me, the gates to the uh, library garage will be open, so you don't need to worry about getting your ticket stamped or putting your $2 in. Um, uh, we are very grateful to uh, the uh, Truman Library Institute, our partner, the Truman Presidential Library, uh, in this series, this great series with David Vondrilli, Dateline Washington. And uh, David will take us on his uh, magic carpet, escape uh, the bounds of gravity without losing his sense of gravity. Well, maybe not most of the time. Um, uh, with Joel Achenbach tonight. And, uh, David uh, is, of course, as those of you who've been uh, uh, to uh, uh, either of his presentations before, our first uh, Dateline Washington, or uh, his uh, conversation with us about, <clears throat> excuse me, about his book uh, uh, on uh, Abraham Lincoln, uh, you'll, you'll know that David is one of the most distinguished uh, journalists in the, in the United States. Uh, he uh, uh, was a Marshall Scholar at Oxford uh, with a Master's in Literature, which uh, explains uh, the, the beautifully written uh, books. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, he's been uh, on NPR, uh, an assistant managing editor of what you will, as we go through this series, Dateline Washington, will learn to call WAPO, uh, the Washington Post. Um, and uh, he is now the, uh, the editor-at-large uh, at Time Magazine, where um, he has done uh, stories uh, on uh, Glenn Beck, uh, Chief Justice Roberts, and the President of the United States, there, thereby running the entire table on the emotional temperament of the United <laughs> States. Um, and he's bringing with him tonight uh, a, a very distinguished journalist as well, Joel Achenbach, uh, who is a staff writer, uh, columnist, blogger for WAPO, right, um, uh, Washington Post. Uh, he's been a contributor to Slate uh, and National Geographic, uh, a Princeton graduate, and himself the author of some wonderful books. Uh, the Grand Idea, which is a book about uh, George Washington, uh, the opening of the West, the engineering of the Potomac uh, canals, uh, and, and a, a part of George Washington's vision that we don't often uh, know about. Um, also, uh, a book that I originally thought might be about uh, me and my children captured by aliens, uh, the, the, the Search for Life and Truth in a Very Large Universe. Uh, he blogs about Bigfoot and uh, uh, Megalodon, uh, does want me to tell you that he was not an advisor on the movie Sharknado, though. Um, <laughs> Uh, but he is an expert, uh, for those of us who listened to him uh, on uh, uh, KCUR today, uh, on uh, asteroids and, and what NASA is trying to, to, to do with them, uh, and also has, has recently uh, written uh, about the, the uh, uh, Deepwater Horizon uh, disaster, the BP oil spill, uh, with a book called A Hole in the Bottom of the Sea. And last but not least, I have to tell you, he is the winner of the Philip Class Award for Outstanding Contribution in Promoting Critical Thinking and Scientific Knowledge, which is given out by an organization I plan to join tomorrow, the National Capital Area Skeptics. <laughs> so, ladies and gentlemen, David Vondrilli and Joel Achenbach. Thank you very much, everyone, for coming out tonight. It's a joy to be back here, especially with uh, one of my favorite people and closest friends. I'll, uh, I'll, I guess, may as well let the cat out of the bag. When Henry Fortunato of the library first proposed this series to me, uh, I immediately recognized it as a chance to get my friends to come to Kansas City, and uh, that's. <laughs> That's my ulterior motive here, but I think you'll be glad uh, that I did. Before we get started, I do want to introduce a distinguished guest in our audience tonight. I'm not sure everyone in Kansas City understands that right now on the distant red planet, this fabulous uh, rover that's uh, covering, uh, uh, bringing back all this 
fascinating scientific information was actually named by a resident of our fair metropolis. And she's with us here tonight, Shawnee Mission East student Clara Ma. Clara, where are you? Stand up, stand up. Stand up. All right, Clara. Yes. She, she's on the East Robotics team with my son, Henry, and I'm hoping some of that will rub off <laughs> on him. Uh, we, can, we can dream. Um, tonight, Joel Achenbach. Uh, years ago, uh, when I was drummed out of uh, academia, uh, Crosby left that part out. I was awarded a master's degree in literature on the condition that I stop studying literature. There was this requirement and uh, I, I needed a job and so the only thing I knew how to do was uh, journalism, which doesn't, as you know, doesn't require any special skills. And I got a job at a place where a lot of young people were going in those days, the Miami Herald. I was very lucky to get there. And there was, I won't Hold on a second. get too is boring Is this going to be this. the life story it of is, David yes, Von life story of David Von <laughs> Is anyone else having that question? In when we, when okay, I got okay. there, there were a lot of talented young people there, but there was this cult around one young reporter uh, who, who, who drove a car that would not turn right, so he would arrive at places by going around the block, a series of left turns. But he was so talented that literally the editors in the room would not speak to each other because they were fighting over him and his time. And this was proved to be Joel Achenbach. I was in awe of him from the start. Uh, <laughs> although okay. as I came to know him, that awe was tempered by a realization that we shared a, mm -hmm. a deep social misfit streak, I would yeah, say. Yeah. He, he, he's, he's still in awe. Yeah, I, I, I am. I, I think you can I'm sense still it, in can't awe. you? At you any can, rate, you we, can feel it in the room, the awe. <laughs> we uh, we uh, reconnected at the Washington Post, where he was and continues to be that rarest of Washington journalists. Uh, Employed. Em <laughs> <laughs> uh, I can't, I can't, I won't even finish that sentence. So. He is a child of the 60s, and children of the 60s dreamed of human beings traveling in space, boldly going where no one had gone before. He's uh, been chronicling that dream now for 30 years, and he's here to report on the state of that dream. His excellent piece ran on the front page of the Washington Post this weekend. Joel, tell us what's going on at NASA. Okay, just the child of the 60s thing, I'm, I'm not high right now, just to make, it, make that clear. However, I'm going to tell you what NASA's up to, and, and you may wonder if the people at NASA are, are high. Um, so the, the, the basic problem, and, and I think what we're going to talk about with, with, with space travel, the basic problem is that the thing that everyone wants to do is very hard to do, and that's to go to Mars. I mean, that's the, that would be, it'd be really neat to have a, a human being, a geologist, a scientist, or a team of them on Mars to figure out what happened to that planet. It's, it's a dead planet as far as we can tell. There might be some vestigial life on it, but we think that there was life three billion years ago, and there's not anymore. It'd be nice to have people on Mars to dig around. Now, right now, uh, we have uh, um, this rover, Curiosity, that is probing and trying to find out some of these secrets. But you have to operate the rover from Earth, and there is a huge time delay to try to operate a rover. It's essentially a fairly sluggish operation. It'd be great to have a human being with hands, you know, or gloves, whatever, to say, let's turn over that rock, let's, let's dig there, let's go deeper. Um, so that's, that would be a great goal, and I think everyone in the space program would like to do that. The problem is that Mars is very far away. All objects in the solar system are all moving. Uh, it's not like it's parked there waiting for us to go to it and come back. It's moving too. 
any trip to Mars takes at least two years. We've never had a trip like that in the space program. And although you can come up with designs for doing it, and I think that later this year we'll hear some more suggestions for how you might do it, uh, under today's budgets, under today's you know, fiscal realities, we're not going to be able to go to Mars with a government agency paying the, paying the freight. It's just, it's, it's, it's too far, too difficult, too costly. So what's the fallback position? The fallback position, according to our national space policy of 2010, is to go to an asteroid by 2025. President Obama said in a speech in April, April 15th, 2010, down at the Kennedy Space Center, he said, we're gonna send humans for the first time to an asteroid by 2025. Then we'll send them in orbit around Mars in the 2030s with, at some point, a landing to follow. Now, the idea is going to an asteroid is easier than going to Mars. But here's the problem. It's still too hard. <laughs> and I did not know this until I started reporting my story. I, you know, I, I always think, you know, well, which asteroid were, were they, would, they go, where, would they go to, and where is this asteroid? Well, again, these things are all moving. It's not so much the where, it's, well, how fast is it moving? You know, how, what's the trajectory you're going to take to get there? You know, engineers talk about delta V, the change in velocity. There's a, any trip to, to an asteroid, even one that comes kind of close to the Earth, that trip, round trip, is going to take a year. Now, does NASA have a spaceship that can go orbit the sun, tracking an asteroid, and come back to Earth? No, it doesn't have that. They do, have, however, have a lot of hardware they're building. It's just, it, this is going to get a little complicated, here, but I'm going to power we're, through. We're okay? with you so far. Okay. So, asteroid. All right, so you can't, so, this, so, so Obama says we're going to go to an asteroid. What happened to the moon? Last time I checked in, we were going back to the moon. So the problem with the moon is that we've already done that. Been there, done that. It, 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 and that's a pretty compelling problem. We didn't find much there. Well, I mean, it, 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 wasn't, it wasn't horrible. No. I mean, you know, it, 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 it was it, paradise it, compared to Mars yeah, or no, an asteroid. The moon, and the, moon had, has, <laughs> the moon has certain advantages. First of all, it's only three and a half days away. Mm -hmm. You can go there and come back in a week. I mean, it's, it's, <laughs> it's really not very far away. <laughs> So, so President Bush, in fact, said, we're going to go back to the moon. He said, we were going to have a whole new program. It's going to be called Constellation. Constellation is going to have a new rocket that will take astronauts to orbit, a new heavy lift rocket that would take astronauts to the vicinity of the moon, a new capsule called Orion, which will go on top of this rocket, and the astronauts will ride in this capsule, and the new lunar lander called Altair, which will go down to the moon, and then we'll have a sustained human presence on the moon that'll get us more comfortable with sort of living off the planet. And eventually then we'll go to Mars. Um, there's always a sort of like, and then we'll go to Mars. You know, it's, it's, it's always easy to sort of tack that on, okay? So the problem with that is that when Obama became president, he said, I don't wanna go back to the moon, okay, essentially. And he had political appointees who said, if you want to go to Mars, going to the moon is, 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 um, is sidetracking you, literally. And moreover, uh, Obama appointed a panel of people led by a very distinguished former aerospace executive named Norman Augustine who looked at the Constellation program and said, it doesn't make sense. The timelines don't make sense. The budgets don't make sense. There's no money for this. At the, at the rate you're going, you're, you're not going to get anywhere near the moon until the late 2020s, and you have no money left for a lander. So all you're going to be able to do is sort of circle the moon. And so they said, Let, let's change our whole strategy and look at something called the flexible path. And Obama has adopted the flexible path approach. And the approach, and it's, it's, it's not a bad idea. The idea is let's focus on investing in new technology, investing in new ways to do things, new propulsion mechanisms. Let's, in, let's invest in some, some things that will help us get to Mars someday. And let's not focus on like going back to the moon. Well, meanwhile on Capitol Hill, 
the Congress decides, yeah, but we kind of liked all this money we were giving to some of our favorite congressional districts <laughs> to build some of this hardware to go back to the moon. So they're still building the heavy lift rocket that can get you near the moon. And they're still building the Orion space capsule that will go on top of that rocket. And this raises an obvious question. <laughs> What are they going to do with that? Yeah, what are they going to do with that? Okay, so now you're building a rocket. Uh, it's going to cost some billions of dollars. You're building a space capsule. Again, billions of dollars. What are you going to do with this? You're not going to go up to the space station because it's in low Earth orbit, and this, this stuff is, is way overbuilt for that. The capsule is overbuilt for that. The rocket is a heavy lift rocket. It's designed to go to the moon. They're not building a lander, so they had to go somewhere with it. And that brings me finally to, okay, the asteroid redirect mission, which is what I, I wrote about in our story that ran Sunday in the Washington Post. And I the encourage you- The asteroid redirect mission. It was originally called the asteroid retrieval mission, but I guess they thought that sounded silly. <laughs> um, so the asteroid, uh, no. Let me be, there, there, there is a lot to be said positively about the idea. It actually does bring together a lot of things that NASA wanted to do. So here's what's good about the asteroid redirect mission. First of all, the idea is you'd send out a robotic spacecraft that would extrude this sort of tent-like moon bounce contraption that would swallow a rock, a small asteroid. Then using a new propulsion mechanism would bring it back to the moon and go into uh, a high retrograde orbit around the moon, which is about 40,000 miles above the moon, it goes around the moon. Then you would launch in your new heavy lift rocket, in your new capsule, two astronauts. They'd fly to the moon, or near the moon. They'd go into orbit around the moon. They would dock with the robotic spacecraft that has the bagged rock on the end. They would then open up the capsule. Unfortunately, they forgot to build a, um, uh, an airlock, but, <laughs> but, but, but they can bring along extra canisters of, of breathable air and then open up the capsule to space just the way they did back during the Gemini program in the 1960s. And the, the two astronauts aboard uh, and, and Orion's built for four, but you could only bring two astronauts on this mission because because the capsule's filled with tanks of breathable air. Um, so you, the two astronauts aboard, hopefully they've already put on their spacesuits by now because the hatch is open. <laughs> they would climb out of the capsule and they would climb along a rail or whatever and, and, and eventually come up to this bag inside of which is a rock and they would then encounter the asteroid and do whatever, whatever that involves, <laughs> uh, whatever people do when, when, when they encounter a rock. Uh, I, you, you chip at it, you know, you write your initials in it, I guess, you know. Um, I want to say- Kilroy was here. <laughs> Kilroy I don't know was here. What you do, what you, and then they would take samples back and they'd fly back to Earth and splash down the ocean and that would be the asteroid redirect mission. I want to say two things about that. Number one, it sounds absolutely insane. And number two, it sounds really cool. I mean, yeah. I've thought about it all day yeah. since I and read your story, thought about it after hearing you talk about it on the radio this morning. And the more I hear it, crazy as it is, the more I like it. I mean, can you imagine grabbing an asteroid? And obviously you can imagine it, you just described it. We have what never, we have never redirected a natural an object from its natural orbit. orbit. We've never done anything like it. It, it, it would be, I mean, we, sh we should say up front, it's not going to happen. But, <laughs> but, but, but and, and, you know, and, and, and people may watch this, you know, uh, on the internet, and I should make clear that, you know, it could happen under certain timelines, it could happen under certain budgets. We call, a we call this story and you can Google this phrase, NASA's mission improbable, because under the projected timeline that they, when they announced this, um, they, would say, they said that this would happen ideally in 2021 on the very first mission of, the, the very first crewed mission of the Orion space capsule. The people who run the, the human spaceflight program don't want to do something this elaborate on their first 
crude mission. They would, they, their first mission with people on it, they, they would prefer something a little simpler and safer. safer. I mean, if they're going to go fly to the moon, you know, and go in orbit around the moon and come back home, arguably on your first flight with new hardware, that's enough. Without then doing spacewalks and doing something with, in, in this bag with the asteroid inside. Um, the other problem uh, with the program is that the, the rock that they're going to grab and capture, uh, they don't have a rock. They don't have they don't a have, rock. They, don't, they, haven't, <laughs> they haven't found that rock. So to, for that for it to work, you have to understand, so you have a robotic spacecraft goes out. Here's an asteroid coming along. What do asteroids do? As you know, asteroids spin and they tumble. So it can't be spinning too much and it can't be tumbling too much. These are to two totally different things, okay? You know, maybe it's not spinning very much, but it's tumbling a lot, okay? Can't have too many axes of rotation. It can't be too big or too small. I mean, one concern, which we mentioned, is that when you see a little streak of light in a telescope, you can't tell how big it is. You can't tell how big that object is. It's just, you get a few pixels of data. What, what is that thing? Some of these things may not even be asteroids. They could be um, rocket boosters that have been left in space from other space missions. <laughs> and so the, the worst thing that could happen is they do all this foo for all and they send this robotic mission out there with the big bag comes out and it grabs something that has Russian writing on it. <laughs> you know, not, you don't, you don't want that. that, that and actually the, the thing that I think would be worse is, is They've talked about, okay, so let, let's say we can't find the right rock. It's going too fast, it's tumbling, it's, it's, it's too crumbly, it's just a bag of, of stones or it's like a, you know, a, a sandbar in space. Let's, so let's, we'll go to plan B, we'll go and we'll just break a boulder off a known asteroid. An asteroid, we know where it is, we know how big it is, it's, you know, it's a big, big old thing. You know? We'll go break off a boulder and bring that back. But what worries me about that, and I think what worries some of them is that you may wind up with a, with a rock that is it's just kind of underwhelming, okay? It may, be, it may only be about the size of this chair, you know, uh, that I'm sitting in. And so you, you've, you've got all this elaborate stuff going on to encounter just, you know, it's this little rock, you know, and it's like, and, and it, 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 I don't know if you know the movie, this is Spinal Tap, where the Stonehenge comes down and it's too small, you know, so there's the old, you know, this is Spinal Tap problem. You want, you want, you know, Obama said we will send humans to an asteroid, okay? Ideally, he was thinking of something more than we're going to send humans to something the size of a hassock, you know? You, do people know what a hassock wait, is? No, is that, that's uh, uh, that's a word, right? I mean, I didn't. It, they, it's yeah, okay. but it's all, always preceded by the word grandmas. Um, uh, yes, when I hear the president say humans to an asteroid, I think of something they could, for example, stand on. Yeah, or blow up. <laughs> blow up. Right? No, yeah. I mean, I, I thought well, a lot. That, that actually takes me to my next question, which is obviously. The reason that we would start with a small asteroid is because all this technology would help to save us in case a large asteroid is found coming to destroy Earth and, and extinguish us like the dinosaurs. Right. Okay, so this was heavily marketed earlier in the summer as planetary defense, i.e., if you can move this rock, maybe you can keep a big old rock from hitting the right. Earth. The problem with that is that it's not true. <laughs> okay. um, because Houston, they, we need a, a bigger bag. The kind of, of there, 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 there are reasons for doing this mission that, that would be helpful long term for, for example, a Mars mission. But you probably would not use any of this kind of, uh, of architecture, as they say, to move a rock that's going to hit the, the Earth. Okay, because. First of all, the, the, the rocks that, 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 are, that you could bag are going to be in the order of the size, you know, maybe 20 to 30 feet across. That's the size roughly, actually a little bit smaller, than the rock that, 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 that exploded over Russia earlier this year, quite spectacularly. No one got killed by that. Those size rocks aren't planet killers. You don't need to deflect a rock that size. 
You need to deflect a rock that's, that's closer to you know, a mile across, not 30 feet. And you would not use any of this kind of a system to do that. You would probably use something a little more um, like a, a video game where you use some kind of kinetic force to blast the rock. So if, if it's planetary defense you want to do, I don't think you would do any of these things. At the root of this asteroid redirect mission is the fact that it gives you a place to go with the new rocket or the new spaceship. It also, and, you could, and so you could say cynically, it's, you know, it's, a, it's kind of a, a made up destination in a way to create some political cover for these very expensive uh, pieces of hardware that have stakeholders uh, out there who want to keep building this stuff and they don't want to have to answer the question, where is it going to go? Well, so they could say, well, it's going to go save the Earth by deflecting an asteroid. Mm -hmm. But um, the argument in favor of the new rocket uh, and, and the new space capsule is you need stuff like this to go to Mars someday. So if you're going to go to Mars someday, you're going to have to, you're going to, have to start taking some steps. And so maybe this is not the perfect mission. Maybe going out to the moon and encountering an asteroid, or more likely, going out to the moon, going around the moon and coming home, it is a little underwhelming. But if we're ever going to do this human mission to Mars, we got to start taking steps to go beyond low Earth orbit. And I'm sympathetic to that, that argument if Mars is the goal. But if Mars is the goal, you might want to put together a Mars program in which everything you do helps you get to Mars and you're not doing any shenanigans along the way, okay? Because the money is tight and you want to keep your eyes on the prize. Now, years ago when I was in the early years of my Achenbach worship, uh, you wrote a piece that was very formative of my thinking about space in which, as I recall, you basically laid out two essential problems facing human exploration, physical exploration, and we'll come to the robots later, of space. One of them was speeds and distances, right? Things are simply too far apart. And the second was that space is a really nasty place for human beings to spend any time. Cosmic rays and all sorts of stuff. You wrote in your book, Captured by Aliens, uh, available on Amazon, which despite the title is highly scientific, uh, really wonderful read about all the subjects we're talking about here and this compelling desire that we have to think about this idea of traveling through space. Um, you, you wrote about some of the ideas coming out of JPL and some of the other really big thinkers about how we might conquer one or both of these issues, that things are too far and that space is too uh, hostile. Talk a little about that and tell us, are, are those things real? Are, are, are scientists making theoretical progress on either one, speeding us up or uh, making us more robust for space? Well, you know, speed is not the only virtue. Another thing is sort of energy efficiency. So one of the nice things about this asteroid redirect mission is it uses something called solar electric propulsion, um, which this robotic spacecraft essentially is a solar array. It doesn't, it doesn't um, go fast so much as it's, it's very efficient. You don't have to use lots of chemical propellants to get someplace. And so um, there's a lot of different ways to do space travel. It is unfortunate the solar system uh, was designed the way it was because it really, <laughs> there should be some, some place easier to go <laughs> past the moon other than Mars. Um, the, uh, you know, as you said in your, in your intro, I mean, I, I've always assumed that we were going to be part of this expanding civilization and expanding into space, that space was where our, our destiny um, uh, would be found in, in, a, in a certain way. And I don't know if I really believe that the way I did as, as a kid. I do think it's possible. I think that it's challenging, though. You know, when you look at Star Trek and they're zooming all over the galaxy and there's warp bait and all that, it seems like um, that Einstein's rules on 
the speed of light as the ultimate cosmic speed limit have withstood many assaults in recent years. Last year, there was a story we ran saying, oh, they, there are neutrinos that are going faster than the speed of light, and Einstein was wrong. Um, no, Einstein was right. Our story was essentially <laughs> wrong. I mean, the who are you going to believe? Yeah, who are you going to believe? Who are you going to believe? Yeah, believe? Yeah, good, rule, yeah, good rule is you know, stick with Einstein on this stuff. Um, so it, 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 it's very far to the nearest star. It's very far uh, even to Mars. Uh, that said, it, it's, it, you know, you're always making a mistake if you, if you predict anything more than about five years in the future. I mean, in, in there's so much of our lives today, you know, you know, we could not have imagined, you know, even when, when, when like you were a kid back in the 40s. Right. You know. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I just, okay, I don't know. Um, cheap shot, so. Um, but you know, I mean, so I, I mean, a lot of what we see today is, feels like magic. So, I, I, and, and Mars, has as much land as the Earth. It's, um, it's very far away, but it is sort of the, the doable mission you could imagine out there. So could they do it? I don't see how um, the United States government is gonna be able to do it in the near future because it would cost a lot of money. Governments are also risk averse. One of the problems with NASA is it can't kill the astronauts, okay? And if you're in the private sector, an entrepreneur, you can come up with plans that, oh, well, you know, we're gonna send a fleet of rockets there and we're gonna have a colony with 80,000 people, you know, and, and it's, a lot of that, that stuff is just not very plausible. You know, NASA wants to actually land astronauts safely and bring them back to Earth. That costs more. <laughs> okay, if they stay alive, that costs extra, um, and and so um, the uh, so the Curiosity rover that we mentioned earlier was a one-ton payload, so it's a big object, but to put humans on Mars, that's forty tons, and that's really really a whole different technology to land something that heavy. Now you'd say, well. I said to the experts at NASA, why not land the fuel and the food and the astronauts and you know the Starbucks all separately in four separate <laughs> four separate payloads, right? Mm -hmm. And he, he made the point that um, well, you know, it's kind of hard to uh, to pinpoint your landing spot, you know, and so you can just imagine that, you know, you land on Mars, you know, where's our food? Where's the food? Yeah, it's the other side of that mountain, <laughs> okay? You know, it's like, it, it, so it, it's, it, it's, um, and, then, and so the Mars rover lands, and it used, in part, a parachute. It used several different mechanisms. Thrusters, it used a, a, an aero brake where it comes in and just uses the thin atmosphere a little bit. So you think, well, why don't you use a bigger parachute? You'd need a parachute the size of the Rose Bowl, okay? Now, fold that up, okay, and put that inside of a, of a spacecraft and let it unfurl, you know, <laughs> nicely in, in a place that has essentially almost no, no atmosphere. That's not gonna work. I mean, just they're, they're, the physics there are, are very challenging. So, um, I, 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 I can't remember what the question was. <laughs> I forgot. I remember you talking about ships powered by light itself with sails that would be propelled by light rays and talking about space elevators and some ideas that are more, feel more sort of futuristic than a, a simply a larger Roman candle than the one we have right now. How's yeah, that coming so, along? How's that coming along? The space <laughs> elevator? Yeah. Well, the, the, the nice thing about the space elevator, as I understand it, is that you could essentially, if you could create a, a very long cable from the ground up to about 22,000 miles above the surface, you could just, things could would just sort of, by centrifugal force, ride up the cable into space. Um, the problem with that is, um, uh, it's, it, it, someone cuts the cable and then it's, it, it's a big mess. And you you're know? gone. Uh, you know, it's, 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 it's not a robust system, you know, it's, and, mm -hmm. and I don't see that happening anytime soon. Um, 
I, 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 think, the, I think the question, and, and, and the truth is, is that Dave and I have been arguing about this for, for decades, literally, is do we have a future in space? You know, in, is our future in space robotic? You know, is it space science? Or does it involve human beings actually going there? And I, I mean, Dave has said all along, well, what do you think? I mean, this is your, this is. I think, this yes, is, we have a future, and yes, it's robotic. I think that we've come up against the, we're, in the immortal words of Ned Beatty, in, uh, in, in network, we're messing with the powerful forces of nature here. That uh, well, we we've can't been doing go, that. We've been doing that for a we, million we years. We cannot go fast enough. We cannot I mean, go far I mean, enough. But I mean, we have this tremendous capacity to create these uh, eyes and ears that can go to these places for us. I hope, if you haven't seen this, I hope you all go home and Google two things. Joel's article from this weekend, and then the- Mission uh, Improbable. Mission Improbable at WashingtonPost.com. And then the astonishingly beautiful picture, one of the most beautiful things I've ever seen that NASA released, was it two weeks ago? From the, uh, the probe that is behind Venus now, that has captured a picture of the Earth offset by the profile of Venus and the rings. It was spectacular, vastly more moving and powerful and poetic than uh, anything from the subsequent Apollo missions after the first one, and, and, and uh, much better than the Winnebago in space, which is what I call the International Space Station. Um, uh, so why aren't we pouring all this money and effort and attention into these things? Uh, because they are the extensions of us, and we can't go there. Have you ever been in a Winnebago? Yes. I mean, I, I, I think those things are pretty cool. Uh, <laughs> I mean, you know, the, 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 the space station, though it has been derided by certain cynics over time, <laughs> um, the space station... Uh, has, I think, over time won people over in part because they built it. And it's, it's up there and it, it seems to, to work. It is this big laboratory that's going around the Earth. And if you saw, as actually Dave pointed this out to me, the, the great David Bowie song that was covered by astronaut Chris Hadfield uh, a, a few months ago. Third, third thing to Google. This it's is really a, worth seeing. I sent it to Joel with a note that said the best thing they've done, best thing yeah. NASA's done yeah. since. Apollo 11. Yeah, it, it, it was really a wonderful uh, a video that Chris Hadfield did. Um, the, it, it, I am, you know, I'm Mr. Science and all in favor of robotics. I do believe that the human presence um, adds an extra layer to these programs. And I also think from a pragmatic standpoint that that sort of drives a lot of the um, interest in the agency and the funding for, for, the, for, the, for NASA. So if, if, if NASA just had a robotics program, I'd, I think it would be a much smaller agency. Yeah, I mean, you, you could argue it around or square. In fact, I would, I, are we going to take questions? I mean, how do yes, you, we yeah. will eventually uh, so take questions. I, um, I don't have a, you know, I'm, I'm writing about this. I don't have a strong opinion about what they should do, but I would not dismiss the <clears throat> importance of the fact that right now Americans and Russians together are up on the space station, or the fact that Canadian Chris Hadfield, when he was up on the station, and he had, they had to do an emergency repair of something that was broken, it was a leaking, leaking ammonia coolant it was leaking out of the space station, they had to, out of the space station, they had to very quickly put together a, an emergency spacewalking um, mission and it helped that Chris was fluent in Russian and he and his Russian partner could, could help work to get these two spacewalkers out the door. I mean, it is a potential arena for, for human cooperation among nations that otherwise are not always getting along real well. Um, so um, I think that I, I, I wouldn't completely- How far away is the space station from us when it passes right overhead? Um, well, uh, I can't speak for Kansas City, but mm -hmm. from, from Washington, D.C., it's about 250 miles up. 250 Here in the mountains, miles. it's different. Yeah. You know. <laughs> 
250 miles. So, see, I, I, I believe that most Americans would guess that it's farther away than, say, Tulsa. Okay, well, okay true. It's, by distance, it's not a long way. But guess what? It's in space, okay? <laughs> okay, so there's no air, okay? There's, no, it, there's it, you know, it is a completely different environment. Also, it's going around the Earth, uh, uh, you, you know, every 90 minutes. What did you do today? <laughs> What other than uh, the, the, the human uh, aspiration that was satisfied by, uh, or that aspect of Apollo was so important and imprinted you, imprinted even cynical me to a much smaller extent. Um, what was the scientific value of that? That's the epitome of successful human space exploration. What, uh, 30 years, 40 years later, what is the bottom line on uh, science I, out of Apollo? I, I think that if you measure it purely in terms of science, the, the yield was, was, was not as great as if you measure it in terms of engineering. And I think that we shouldn't dismiss engineering no. and the management that goes into it. You know, how are we going to actually pull this off? How are we going to come up with the systems of pr procuring the, the, the hardware, um, you know, making all this stuff work in terms of communications? I mean, I, I, I think that Apollo probably uh, uh, played an important role in the technological um, evolution of our, uh, of our whole civilization. You know, above and beyond, you know, things like, you know, Velcro and, and Teflon and things like that, simply to be able to pull off a very complex uh, uh, mission like that, uh, you know, lessons are learned. And I think that the, I think, uh, you know, if, can I get, can I get profound for just a second? You, know, you, you can try. So I'll put uh, um, You know, I think that we, we that we're, what we're witnessing is the, the planet becoming much more of an engineered planet. And, um, and that means that it's, it's, you know, it's someday every blade of grass, you know, could have its own barcode. I don't know. The point is that we ha we're going to have to figure out how are seven or eight or nine or 10 billion people going to live here. And that is a management problem. It's an engineering problem. I mean, I'm all in favor of back to nature and let's, let's, let's go, go live in the woods like Thoreau, but how are we gonna feed everyone? How are we gonna give them water? How are we, gonna, how, how are we going to um, keep from polluting our planet? How are we gonna keep the atmosphere from um, uh, becoming you know, too choked with carbon dioxide and methane and, and having runaway climate change? These are all really complex uh, problems that in, are going to require solutions that include, among other things, engineering and, and, and management on a, on a global scale uh, and, and almost certainly involve technology to some degree. So how are you going to do that? Well, you know, the, the space program, although it's true, you can say, well, why are we doing that? You know, why are we doing that? I, I think if, if, if you develop skills at solving hard problems, they can be applied potentially to the hardest problems of all, which is how are we going to save the Earth and keep ourselves from ruining this beautiful planet? And the final point, which I know you agree with, thank you, thank you. Um, <laughs> the final point is that I, I think one thing that the space program tells us is that in the near term and probably in the middle term, this is where we're going to live. We're not going to live on Mars. We're not going to live in space colonies. We're not going to live on the moon. We're not going to live, you know, on, on some moon orbiting uh, Saturn or Jupiter. It's, we're, it, we're here. This, and we're not going to have a second chance. And that's one thing we've learned, even as we've encountered these obstacles of trying to figure out what to do next after going to the moon. And we had the space shuttle. We had the space station. Now we have, you know, struggling to figure out how to go, where else to go. I think one of the lessons is, okay, make sure that you keep Spaceship Earth running well. So. I think you succeeded in profound. I, uh, Thank you. Um, <laughs> you. 
Now you, uh, you work at the Washington Post, which has been in the news itself uh, in the past 10 days. Uh, you, the company, after being owned for 80 years uh, by the Graham, Meyer Graham family, has been sold to a space entrepreneur, yep. of all people, Jeffrey Bezos, founder of Amazon, chairman of Amazon.com. Uh, he, so he is now facing, I think, two uh, challenging missions. He's trying to do uh, private sector space exploration. I'd like to hear you rate his chances at that, but uh, he's also trying to bail out uh, a metropolitan newspaper, which may be harder. Talk to us a little bit about that. Yeah, so if, yeah, if, 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 if he can put a man on the moon, could he possibly save the Washington Post? I, I, that's sort of what you're asking. Yes, just, exactly. I, I mean, I, I, his company's called Blue Origins, and I actually don't know much about it, so I'm not going to really speak to it other than it, it wants to, to do some kind of private venture involving suborbital flights and then orbital flights into space. Um, but uh, I, I, I'm going to do some further reporting, reporting on that, and I'd, I'd love to talk to Bezos about you know, what he wants to do in space. Richard Branson is another entrepreneur who's interested in space tourism. Um, Robert Bigelow in, La, in Las Vegas. Uh, the, probably the most prominent is Elon Musk, who, uh, who, owns, who runs SpaceX, and he also uh, is the owner of Tesla, the electric car company. And Elon is very much a believer in going to Mars someday. And it may be that the first human mission to Mars will be from the private sector, maybe with some public um, uh, involvement, maybe a public-private partnership, but, th but there's a you, lot you of You reported that Elon Musk, which I had not heard, he wants to go himself. <laughs> he wants to go himself to And Mars. preferably to have that be his last adventure. He's he not like worried to, about he, coming back, in other He doesn't words. Worry, he, worry about coming back. He would, he would be happy to end his life on Mars. Um, so, now Which I think much, if he goes, he has, stands a very good chance. Yeah, he's a good chance, <laughs> yes. And, 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 and to his credit, he understands that, which is why he, ha he hasn't climbed into a rocket ship yet. Uh, but the, so the question is, in a way, is how much, how real are these entrepreneurial space ventures? And it's a little too soon to say, that's gonna be one of the stories I do in the coming weeks, is try to, is try to report that out. So I, I can, I can um, make an assessment of that. Uh, but um, you know, to the question of the post, uh, as you know, we are all at the Post quite shocked and rattled by this, this change in ownership, uh, also hopeful. I think that the, the you know, we, there's a lot of affection for the Graham family. There's a lot of security that has come from knowing that the Graham family owned the paper because we, kn we because among other things, Don Graham, the chairman of the board of the Washington Post Company, worked at the newspaper. This is someone who was, you know, he was to the manor born. His, you know, his, his mother, Catherine Graham, um, uh, you know, owned, owned the paper. And, but Don went off to Vietnam. He came back, he was a DC cop. He, was, he worked uh, in, in the, the production uh, room and, and he was a sports, editor, he worked on the city desk, I mean he worked his way up through the building, worked in lots of different departments and really got to know the business and so he, he's someone who knows the name of everyone in the building, no matter what your job is. The new owner, we don't know any, we really don't know much about him. What does he want to do? We don't know. How, where's this going to go? What's going to happen to the Washington Post? We don't know. So there's a lot of trepidation and there's a lot of anxiety about that. But I also think there's a lot of um, um, optimism, too. I mean, that's a word you hear a lot in the newsroom. We're optimistic that, that this actually could be good because we've seen already hundreds of our colleagues walk out the door uh, with buyouts in recent years uh, and with some limited downsizing. Uh, the, uh, the paper is smaller, circulation is smaller, the newsroom is smaller. The newsroom is also very different. So. Uh, Dave and I are old school, you know, we, we report stories, we write stories. A lot of people now, they, they work in video or they work um, uh, online only with various kinds of uh, digital journalism. Describe very briefly, because this fascinated me, uh, 
your big project that ran this weekend, uh, you had what were called production meetings, which I don't remember from my newspaper days. And the cast of characters was how many uh, ink-stained wretches at typewriters? Uh, one, right? You? Well, well, yeah, there's a lot of people in the room who were involved in, in elements of the business that are new, uh, as, such as reader engagement. How do, you, to, how do you increase the number of comments from readers? We, we actually, with our article, we pose questions and ask people to, to, to post an answer. Uh, there's, um, uh, the, the, the online template is very sophisticated. There's a motion graphic. So in the old days of the newspaper, you had a little graphic, okay, that diagrams how the mission works. Now you go online, the graphic is a movie. It's a little movie you click on, and, and stuff happens. There's a narrator, <laughs> right? So it's a much, it's, and, and all these people are in the room. And um, so, yeah, it's a, it's a different experience for me because there's so many moving parts now to a newspaper story like this. So where is this going to go? What, you know, 10 years from now, will there still be a print edition? I hope so. I like print newspapers. But you could imagine... Uh, the contrary. You could imagine that maybe the print edition would go away at some point. It depends on how people consume their news. If, if young people don't read print newspapers, at some point they, by, by, by definition, will go away because you cannot sell people something they don't want. You just can't. That's not a business plan. So you got to meet the market where it is. You got to meet the readers where they are. And Hopefully, uh, Jeff Bezos has some ideas for that. Amazon has been wildly successful, uh, even through some hard times when, when people doubted that it could do uh, what, what Bezos set out to do. So there's a lot of optimism in that. I mean, I, I will say this, that um, as far as I'm concerned, you know, there are certain core values. You have to get it right. You have to be fair. You have to, to, to be interesting. You, you, ha you have to be professional. You have to be you know, courteous, but also courageous when you do journalism. You have to um, tell people things they don't know and, 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 and do it in a way that shows a certain amount of craft and flair. You don't, you don't just spurt out everything that you think. You, know, you, don't, you don't put everything you know into the, into the paper. You, you're a filter. You say, you know what? That's not worthy of the Washington Post imprimatur. We're not going to put that in the paper because we're not sure it's true. We're not sure it's important. We're not sure it's decent. We're not, you know, we're not going to put that, okay? That it's, if it's, if it says the Washington Post, it's supposed to have a special level of credibility. Uh, and that, that, that's, maybe that's old school of me, but I, I hope that that, that value system persists. Well, if he, if he does, uh, if he does customer engagement, that will be a, 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 a change for the newspaper business. I, when I was briefly in management at the Post, we used to, they used to send us out to focus groups to listen to our, our subscribers or former subscribers just, you know, talk about the paper and what they liked about it or didn't like about it. And we would sit behind a one-way mirror and they would say things like, the stories are too long. Um, <laughs> I feel guilty because I get all this and, and most of it I don't read and I, I have to throw away, it piles up, it makes me feel bad. And they'd say, could I just buy the section that I like? And we'd say, no, of course you can't. Uh, you have to get it the way we want it. And you know, we'd drive back and in the carpool it'd be like, uh, can you believe the crazy stuff they were saying? Okay. Well, I they want shorter stories? Uh, let's, let's get back to work on our, our uh, seven-part, 27-page uh, series. When I was a, ve when I was a very young... <laughs> I, I, I will tell you something that's going to horrify you. When I was a very young reporter. I had this column. Uh, I got lots of letters with questions from people. It was a question and answer column. And um, I was overwhelmed by, by the mail. And I couldn't possibly answer it all. So I had a, a, a stamp made, like, you know, an ink stamp. And it said... Um, because I get so much mail, I can't normally answer uh, letters uh, personally, but yours was so special, I wanted to write back and say thank you. And I'd stamp it. <laughs> you know, I'd sometimes, I'd, sometimes I'd stamp it twice. It's, like clear. It's, 
anyway, but, but back then we weren't really worried about, about we were making money, you know. It was t yeah, terrible, terrible, but anyway. I'm glad you came to Kansas City. I'm glad you all came out tonight to uh, meet my friend. And uh, thank you very much, Crosby, for having us. Thank you, Crosby. Okay.